I would uh, request the panelists, Dr. Swami and uh, Dr. Rajin Malhotra ji and uh, Poonam ji and uh, Shaina ji to start a uh, discussion. Then we can have uh, uh, perhaps questions from the audience. Sir, uh, Dr. Dr. Swami, would you like to uh, engage with uh, uh, Mr. Malhotra uh, and we can uh, start? I know him too well. <laughs> so we don't know him too well. So, so it would be good to... I'll say what I have to say. Let there be questions. <coughs> oh. There are mics, Mr. Guruji, pass to the audience. So, could you just raise, raise your hands? There are volunteers here who will be passing the mic. Uh, Dr. Swami, I'm Advocate Shweth Rao. I'm a practicing lawyer in Bombay High Court uh, with expertise in criminal and constitutional law. First of all, I'm extremely delighted by your August presence. I'd like to give you credit for valiantly fighting emergency. Secondly, opposing LTT tooth and nail, putting your life at risk. Thirdly, I give you credit two days back for procuring the correspondence between Chidambaram and Raja. <laughs> Ever since you have caught Chidambaram with its pants down, <laughs> He's been silent, and there is a saying: being silent in the face of wrong is no difference from no difference from being a conspirator. Excuse and truth should be loudly transmitted from rooftops. Shreyas, we please ask the questions because a lot of people here. Yeah. 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 Please ask, Dr. Dr. Swami. Please ask your questions. India, to, India has a hostile neighborhood. India has a hostile neighborhood. You have been a strong proponent of Indo-US, Indo-US and Israel strategic ties in terms of economy and military. You are an authority on Chinese economy. You are conversant with Mandarin language. But, but it is known that China has a covert alliance with Pakistan. But in India's supreme economic interest, we need to have economic relations with China. But as far as security is concerned, we need to be wary and circumspect with China because China has been having a, a has unabated territorial hegemony in conquering Arunachal Pradesh and several territorial parts of China of India. So what is your take on that? Excuse me. Be brief. brief. A request for everyone. That was my question. A request for everyone. A request for everyone. Please avoid making speeches. Make your very specific question, please. Thanks. <laughs> well, I think uh, the long and short of it says that you want to know what you do about China, right? <laughs> well, you see, there is no such thing as a country you can trust. The United States, uh, with whom we want to be friends, in 1971, uh, they uh, sent the Seventh Fleet task force into the Bay of Bengal. And you know that uh, there were nuclear weapons on board. So the question of the uh, United States is not that it's going to be friendly, it's a question of the United States' interests. No country should ever deal with another country in the terms of sentiment. If China has capacity to harm you, you should acquire capacity to harm them. Doesn't mean you have to use the capacity, but you have the capacity. China has certain weaknesses, we should recognize that. It has a very long supply line to the borders of India. Therefore, we should be developing the Air Force and the missile strike that in the event of a war, you knock off those supply lines. China has a neighbor like Pakistan, which is totally loyal to China. We should respond by developing a naval base in Kar Nicobar in alliance with uh, Indonesia, because 90% of the Chinese 
foreign trade passes through ships in uh, through the Malacca Strait. So if you are able to control the Malacca Strait, you can suffocate China any time you want. So I think to some extent, uh, Mr. Manmohan Singh is trying that when he is moved to South China Sea. And you see how the Chinese are reacting. So that's the way to deal with it. The, the foolishness was of Jawaharlal Nehru was to abandon your defense preparations because you thought the Chinese are your brothers. And in the, when the Chinese turned around, you were defenseless. So this is the way, even with the United States, we have to look at the United States' interests. We cannot become another Australia or Japan. We have to be an equal partner with the United States, so we may have disagreements with that, we may have agreements with them. But there are some common objectives, such as in terrorism, that's why I say Israel, India and China should, Israel, India and the United States should bond together as, as strategic allies as far as terrorism concerned, which is the number one point. So, do we, should we try to befriend China? Yes. But not with our eyes closed. <coughs> not by wearing a heart on the sleeve, but the full preparation that the event of a war, we should be able to give China a reply. But if it's possible to have give and take to China, then we must engage in that without sacrificing our basic national interests. I have been to China many times, they regard me as a friend, but I have told them that you, uh, you reject the Macron line because you say it's an imperialist line. But you have accepted it with Burma. Burma, they have signed an agreement where they specifically said that the Macron line will be the border between Burma and, and China. So why, how can you raise this argument with us? I was also able to persuade them to open the route to Kailash Mansara, which many governments tried and failed. I think that what we should work towards is a globally is a trilateral combination: United States, China, and India. We are the three most populous countries. We have the three largest GDPs, and uh, I think with the three of us, through the process of give and take, without sacrificing the fundamentals, should try to take together. Okay, there is a question that has come in um, SMS uh, for Dr. Swami. In what way do you think Hindutva will benefit the process of globalization with one Indian attributes? Do you think we'll be able to sustain our relations with the rest of the world by aggressively propagating a single faith? Hindutva is not a faith, it's a Hinduness. It's a, it's a, it's a quality, it's not a religion. Uh, and that's why if you really see the kinds of concepts I'm talking about, Mahatma Gandhi propagated. Many Muslim intellectuals got annoyed with me when I said that you, are, you must acknowledge that your ancestors are Hindus. Well, Jawaharlal Nehru, when he gave his convocation address to the Aligarh Muslim University in 1948, what did he say? He said, I am a Hindu, you are a Muslim, but both our ancestors are the same. We, we derive our sustenance from the great Hindu tradition of India. I am happy to see that the Sufis who, who constitute a very large proportion of Muslim population, they held a rally recently and they said, India is our country because we are 98% from Hindus. So, therefore, when I am talking about Hindutva, I am talking about Hindu values. Values where in the question of bonding between father and son, mother and daughter, <coughs> husband and wife, kinds of things that we have, these are called cultural things. And Muslims and Christians and, and uh, Hindus, they share that uh, culture. What is the international? Internationally, they are all taking to Hindutva. The richest uh, Hollywood actress, uh, Julia Roberts, not only took to Hindutva, she also converted to Hinduism. The man who gave you iPad, Stephen Jobs, was a, was a vagabond till he came to Varanasi to Neem Karoli Baba's ashram and he adopted the Hindu practices and even in his general body he would do Namaste, you should sit uh, 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 cross-legged. 
and the kinds of things he preached to us, Hindu concepts. What is the Hindu concept? The Hindu concept is that you will be, you only have freedom of action, but the reward of your action will be get, will come to you, but in what form, where, you can't say. You may do very good work and get a very good job, but a very bad wife. Or you may get a very bad job and a very good wife. That kind of balancing will take place. And I'm, I mean, I'm not a gender uh, oriented so government, I'll say the same thing for women also. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I think we must understand, that's why the Supreme Court said in 1996, Hindutva is not against the constitution of India. And that's how Manoj Joshi escaped, yes. So, we need not be defensive. This Hindutva is being accepted all over the world today. Even on globalization, there's a book, I forget the name of the author, just come out, I saw it, you can Google it. Ancient Hindu Values for Globalization. So, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, Aham Nija Paraveti, Garana Lagu Chetasam, Udar Charitanam Achu, Chat, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. That means, don't think of this as mine and this as yours and all these petty things, Lagu Chetasam, let's say. Think of the whole world as belonging to you. That means the perspective that we have, and I am not at all defensive about Hindutva. I don't think any Muslim and Christian should be defensive about Hindutva. Take a question from the audience. Who's got the mic? So uh, you started off by saying, so India through the ages uh, was plundered and people coming in. So you look at today's India. So you have one part which opens up for markets, you have factories setting up shop here, everyone wanted to come to India. And the second one man spoke about the agricultural side. So do you see a potential imbalance between these two Indias? Would you acknowledge it and how do you see it shaping up in the near future? No, I don't see any. Uh, we, uh, we can... Uh, modernize our agriculture for which we need an industrial base. But I think uh, we don't have to produce everything like the Soviet model wanted us to do. We should go by the normal laws of economics. And there are many things we can do which, uh, for instance, if you want to knock out China, I'll give you one easy formula. The entire Chinese economic growth has been propelled by exports to Europe and the United States. And where, how do these exports, uh, 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 how are they created? I mean, the, these goods for exports. Semi-processed goods from East Asia go to China, and there they value add it. Take this Lenovo. Lenovo is not a Chinese laptop. It's actually a Taiwan laptop. But the Chinese add value to it. And then they export it. So China has a deficit of trade deficit of trade with East Asia and a surplus of trade with Europe and the United States. Are these East Asian countries, you divert that from India. We have got a cheaper labor force. We have got a court, court system. Our intellectual property rights are better. All that, but the East Asian countries will say, you've got terrible infrastructure. That is why we can't come. There's hassle everywhere. There's octroi. Then they are, maybe in the center you've got economic reform, but in the states you're still living in the past. And uh, or the, if you want to buy land, you have a problem. If you want an electricity connection, you have a problem. So once you get out of that, you can finish China in no time. You can uh, get the, that traffic the, diverted. China will be nowhere. It will, it will, the economy will in the state of collapse. So therefore, I think we need to balance that, but we have a huge advantage, which even the Chinese don't have. You know, the, the agriculture, Indian agricultural research uh, experimental plots produce seven times the output per acre that the average farmer in India produces. Imagine what impact it will have. If you grow three crops a year, you'll get triple the production. And we grow only in 25% of our land, we grow more than one crop. So, the potential is enormous, so you integrate your industrial development with your thing and borrow technology liberally. I think that's the formula for economic renaissance. <coughs>